I would now like to invite Professor Ianti Simply once again to give an overview of the project. Okay, hello again, everyone. So um, I will be speaking on behalf of uh, Pio Marinis, Janine Treffers Daller, and Anusha Balasubramanian, uh, who is our RA in the UK. Uh, I will try and give an overview of uh, the project, the Multilila project. Uh, and uh, report on some uh, preliminary findings, very preliminary findings. You will be able to hear a lot more later on today from uh, our three co-investigators um, in India, um, Minati Panda, uh, Suvarna Ladi, and Lina Mukopadye and their teams uh, on uh, uh, further findings and the preliminary analysis of those. So the project is uh, Multilingualism and Multiliteracy in Primary School Children in India. And uh, as I briefly mentioned in the uh, welcome address, uh, the trigger uh, was to um, question, to try and find a reason for the low learning outcomes that have been reported uh, for primary school children in India, which is uh, um, a multilingual country par excellence. Um, the context in which we framed the question was a context that I also briefly mentioned in the beginning, which is that there is a lot of research, which is not uncontroversial, but it is there, a lot of findings showing that uh, being bilingual or multilingual actually gives you some benefits to attention and learning skills, some general cognitive abilities. And so the research question that we wanted to ask was why, if children in India are multilingual and if the educational system is multilingual, uh, why is it the case that some children in this country do not benefit uh, from being bilingual or multilingual to the same degree as children in other contexts? And I know that the answer that comes to mind straight away is that you have to take into account a million other factors to see why, to answer that question. Um, we didn't take into account a million other factors because that's practically impossible, but we do take into account a number of other factors in our research, and I'm going to present some of those. So uh, in terms of a background um, in the context which we are addressing this question, um, as I said, bilingualism, sorry, there's something, uh, bilingualism has been shown to have beneficial effects on certain skills, cognitive skills, like working memory, cognitive flexibility, attention resources, how we manipulate our attention resources, but also uh, the ability to inhibit, to stop irrelevant information from interfering with our uh, thought and action. So um, these abilities sound very general as I present them, and they are very general. They are supposed to be part of what we call cognitive control. Um, but these abilities are particularly relevant whenever you are trying to learn. So in learning processes, these are, let's say, the fundamental tools that you need to develop. There is work, in fact, by also by one of our uh, co-investigators, Suvarna Ladi, um, and she's going to talk about this in her, um, in, in her talk as well, um, that bilingualism has certain other advantages in aging, so it delays the signs of dementia and, it, and cognitive decline in the elderly. Obviously, we are dealing with children here, so that is not uh, a population that we're going to address, but it's very good to situate the advantages that we find in the picture of bilingualism and multilingualism. Another important advantage uh, of bilingualism is in the area of creativity, and uh, the definition of creativity varies a lot, but uh, it is a measure of divergent thinking. So be able to problem solve in ways that are not the standard ways, being unexpected, being, uh, going for the unexpected solution, uh, considering alternative solutions and answers to a problem. 
So cognitive flexibility is very much related to creativity. And bilinguals have been shown to be um, better than monolinguals in this respect. Let me just uh, briefly introduce um, the core team, the co-investigators. So Theo Marinis and Janine Treffers Dollar, if you can stand up so people can see you. <laughs> okay, these are from the University of Reading. Suvarna Aladi from Nimhans, there she is. Minati Panda from JNU. And Lina Mukopadia from EFLU. So one of the beauties of this team uh, is that uh, we come from, um, some of us come from different backgrounds, right? So uh, Suvarna um, is not a linguist. Uh, she's a lot of other things, but not a linguist. Uh, Minati Panda is, uh, well, not a linguist, I think. Lots of other things, but not a linguist. Uh, Lina is a linguist, and um, we have, I mean, one of the, the beauties of this is that we all try to speak the same language. And in that sense, there's a lot of multilingualism in the team. Um, and in fancier terms, uh, this is called interdisciplinarity. Uh, so um, I think that uh, this is challenging, but it is extremely important, and to me, it's a guarantee uh, for the success of the project. The team does not just include us, it includes a big number of uh, researchers. Uh, so in Delhi, these are the pictures of our uh, research team. I don't know if all of them are here, but if they are, can you stand up, please? <laughs> and uh, the Hyderabad team, um, again, many people, some of them are here. Would you like to stand up, please? <laughs> the ones that could attend. And the Patna team, who also worked in Hyderabad. Could you please stand up? <laughs> Thank you. So as you can see, uh, this project has a uh, lot of people working, both in terms of field work, uh, which is the most important aspect, but also in terms of the support and mentoring that is required. Um, I cannot go on without mentioning um, the two um, partners, our strongest partners in this, um, the Language and Learning Foundation that is um, directed by Professor De Jean Gran, who just gave a lovely talk, which unfortunately I missed, um, and uh, crucially also British Council India that have done uh, impressive work supporting us from even before the project was uh, conceived. And uh, in that uh, respect, I would like to uh, single out the Banjan Chakrabarti and Amy Lightfoot uh, from British Council who have been supporting us. And there is a list of consultants, some of whom are in the room, Rama Matthew, Ganesh Devi, Irjin Gran, Ajit Mohanty, Vasanta Dugirala, and Babi Raju. Um, and we are, uh, of course, their advice throughout the project uh, is uh, precious. In terms of capacity and impact, uh, capacity building is a very important aspect of this project. So we have at least 15 junior researchers and I think there will be more working on the project at the moment. They are all uh, being trained and actively engaged in research ethics, in the design of the materials, in the methods that we use in uh, entering data in a database and in the analysis. Um, so there are two things that this project is trying to achieve. One, uh, of course, is the academic question and the other is impact. Impact at the societal level. And for that purpose, we are looking at two uh, countries. We are looking at India and we are looking at the UK. So we hope that our project will contribute to, uh, in an important way, an evidence-based way, to current discussions in India about what schools are expected to deliver and how they're going to deliver it. And we also hope that the findings uh, from this project will inform the UK about monolingual education, because this is what we have there, 
uh, and what benefits or challenges it implies and it imposes on multilingual children who actually live in the UK as well. So let's start with this uh, background on learning outcomes. So there, is, there are a lot of studies and they have been reported several times before. Uh, ASER studies, they have been conducted actually with more than 600,000 children across India, which show some um, worrying results, okay? So more than half of all children in standard five cannot read a standard two level text fluently and nearly half of them could not solve a standard two level subtraction task. So these are worrying results. I think everybody is aware of those. The government is aware of those. Um, we've heard uh, the representative from the Delhi government uh, speaking about those uh, results. So um, the, we are trying to address the causes, okay? What is the cause of that? Now we know that in terms of, of evidence that has already been collected, not by us, that low literacy and numeracy can actually limit other important capabilities which are actually more important than developing the literacy and numeracy skills in school. And these are critical thinking and problem solving. These are the two abilities that are most important for any individual at any stage of the lifespan. Low educational achievement may also lead to school dropout, and it seems to be a gender-based uh, effect as well, so there is higher dropout rate in schools for girls than for boys. That is also related to the gap that increases between state and uh, government and private schools. Uh, as you know better than I do, there is a large increase in private schools, some of them, of course, most of them low-cost ones. Um, and that is obviously taking away from the population that uh, goes to government schools. Now let me focus on the language of instruction because that is the main, let's say, trigger for that research. We want to see if the low learning outcomes are related to a match or a mismatch between the home language on one hand and the school language or the school languages. Now, there are reports from developing countries that suggest that the large number of children, 220 million children, are educated in a language they do not speak at home. And that also has been suggested to be a cause for poor education quality, dropout rates, and low literacy outcomes. And with that in mind, I mean, this was a report about developing countries, but let me just say, that most children with English as an additional language, which is a different home language, are also monoliterate in English. So they go to a monolingual education system in the UK. So the problem is something that affects, is a problem that we need to look into uh, universally. In terms of our study, um, the, the basic questions are, let's say, dependent variables are the learning outcomes. So we are trying to measure literacy, numeracy, and cognitive skills, some of which have nothing to do with being tested in language, so they're without any verbal material. And in order to do that, we are examining a number of independent variables. So we are looking at educational variables, and we are looking at some variables that are external to education. In terms of educational variables, the important question is mother tongue education, that is whether the child is uh, educated in a language that is his or her home language. Um, and in that respect, we are also looking at the role of English, because as you know, many schools here are English, involve English medium instruction. But we are looking at the role of English and regional languages as mediums of instruction. We are also looking at the extent of linguistic diversity and multilingualism in the classroom. Um, and we're looking at teacher qualification and school pedagogies. So this is all with reference to um, what contributes to the learning environment. We are also looking at variables that are external to this, namely gender inequalities. Uh, 
um, low socioeconomic status and geographical disparity. And I'm going to focus on the ones that you see in red today. Uh, I will be talking about the set of tools that we have developed, and I will report on some results focusing mostly on gender and low socioeconomic status. But you will be able to hear more about classroom observations from Amy Lightfoot tomorrow, and you're going to hear more about findings on mother tongue uh, education from uh, our colleagues who are going to present later on. Now, when we look at geographical and social factors, and this is uh, one of the questions we want to focus on, so we are, the, the project takes place in uh, three areas. So it takes place in Delhi, in Hyderabad, and these are the urban uh, areas we're looking at. And it also takes place in Bihar, which uh, will, be, uh, will involve uh, non-remote uh, rural areas, uh, uh, schools in non-remote rural areas. Now, why Bihar? Well, Bihar is, uh, as has been reported, one of the less developed and educational disadvantaged areas of India. Um, and it, it is important to include the comparison between places like Delhi and Hyderabad with uh, these types of area. Now, within urban areas, we're not targeting middle class or um, upper class uh, children. We are only looking at low socioeconomic status. Uh, we're looking at children in government schools only. Uh, and these children live in disadvantage, some of these children, half of these children, uh, live in disadvantaged low income settlements called slums, as you know, uh, and children in government schools living in other areas also deprived, but not, um, but not at the extreme level of deprivation. Now we all know what slums are, and I give you a couple of definitions that uh, I found in the literature. Um, the particular reason why we are interested in investigating schools that take children from slum areas is because in these areas we find a large number of internal migrants who may speak other languages or varieties of the regional language, okay? So um, it's very important to look at the medium of instruction effect, taking into account also varieties of Hindi, for example, or languages that are typologically close or distant to the language of instruction. So there are other reasons which are more societally driven um, that have to do with urban slums. So the school attendance rates for children living in Delhi slums and rural areas can be low. Um, and there is a study, which is a bit old now, that uh, we have a large number of children attending uh, schools who live in slum areas um, who are overaged. So that gives rise to a lot of inequalities in education provision. Now I have to say, and this is uh, um, something that we have been discussing for the last few days with the team, the term slum can be controversial, right? And uh, since we had these interesting discussions, I tried to read some stuff on, uh, uh, on this and I, I came uh, across this very interesting book by Maine, 2017, uh, Slums, the History of a Global Injustice, where the author is actually proposing that we should retire the word slum, uh, but then he doesn't propose an alternative. So um, I think it's extremely convincing what he's doing, but um, you have to bear with me in using this term. Um, uh, and then if you can offer an alternative, I'll be very happy to adopt it. Now, how do we address our questions in our project? Well, we developed a set of tools, a battery of tasks to examine directly or indirectly the school skills of the children, so literacy and numeracy, uh, but also their cognitive skills, that is the ones that support learning and development, and also the school environment. Okay, so this is in a nutshell, you know, what the tools are trying to do. We use exactly the same tools in each of the sites. The only adaptation that we have to do is when they are language tools, we have to change the language. So the option, of course, is between Hindi and Telugu. 
uh, for Delhi and uh, Hyderabad, and in Bihar, it's, uh, of course, uh, Hindi in the uh, schools that we go to, um, and English is an alternative language for those children that attend English medium instruction schools. So, uh, as I said, it's only government schools that we are testing in, uh, slum versus non-slum areas, and we invited all children in standard four in each school that we visited who were willing to participate. We didn't select children. We asked anyone who would be interested to participate, and I have to say that they're all very excited uh, about participating again to our project because we had the chance to visit yesterday and the day before yesterday some of the schools that we tested in in Delhi and we just saw so much enthusiasm which of course uh, is not just because they like the tasks but because the research associates who actually elicited the data were so very good to the, the children. Okay, so um, first as a background we have some surveys and questionnaires so we have a language questionnaire that we give to the child, and we ask about demographic information, but crucially, we're asking the child what language they use with the father, the mother, the siblings, the grandparents, the extended family, their friends, and what they use with their friends at school and out of school. So we have a, a picture of their everyday linguistic profile. Then we use uh, questionnaires for the head teacher and the maths and language teacher in every school that we recruit children from. So uh, for the head teacher questionnaire, we ask about the demographics of the school, the school curriculum and instruction, teaching practice and attitude. And the same, almost the same is true for the maths and language teacher. Sometimes it's the same person, sometimes it's different. Uh, so we're asking for the training qualifications, language attitude, and that's very important, that is translanguaging. So are they happy to switch between, for example, Hindi and English in Delhi or Telugu and English uh, in Hyderabad uh, when they're teaching a particular subject or uh, any subject at all? We're also looking at their teaching and learning methods and materials, and you're going to hear some of this in tomorrow's plenary by Amy Lightfoot. And this will tell us, this will be revealed also in the classroom observation tool that she will be talking about. Now let me uh, present to you some of the cognitive tasks that we use. So the first thing we wanted to do is look at general intelligence because we don't want, we don't want to have a very basic difference across our, the children that we are testing if their general IQ scores are not, is, are not the same, okay? so. Um, we are looking at Raven's progressive matrices. Uh, we are using that, and I will show you an example. And we also have cognitive skills that support learning, as I said, attention and inhibition and working memory. So Raven's looks like this. Um, so what you have to do is look at the, the big picture, and then you have an option of six pieces. It's like a, a puzzle, okay? Uh, and you have to pick the one that fits the picture. So I hope you can all see that two is the correct answer. Thank you. So you are awake. <laughs> okay, great. Four is the correct answer. Okay. So uh, Ravens uh, is, uh, I mean, in fact, we asked the children yesterday, you know, which, which task they like best. Ravens is one of their favorite. Um, we may be intimidated by it, but children love it. So, um, what it tests is problem-solving skills based on information or data that is not language-based. Okay, that's very important. They love this one as well, which is the flankers task, and um, this actually is a measure of cognitive control. Um, it involves attention and it involves inhibition, the ability to inhibit a response. So what you have to do in this task, you have to press a right or left button on the keyboard depending on where the middle fish is looking. And so you're only looking, you're only paying attention to the middle fish. Now, um, if the middle fish is looking where the other fish is looking, then you just, you know, press the left, for example, in this case. 
and in the other case, you have to press the right button. But what is interesting, I mean, so you as a participant, you just have to press a button, but what we manipulate is how much you are affected by where the other fish is looking, all right? So you have to focus on the middle one, but in the top, in the top example, it's easy because all the fish are looking in the same direct direction, whereas in the second one, the middle fish is looking the other way. All right, so that is what we call the conflict condition. And it is in this condition that we measure how quickly you can respond and whether you can respond accurately or not. And that has to do with your ability to attend to the middle fish and also to inhibit your response. And that's uh, one of my favorite tasks. Um, this is the end back. It's called updating. It's supposed to be, um, it's a two back task and I will explain to you how it works. You look at the computer screen and you see one digit at a time, one number at a time. And what you're asked to do is to press a button when the number you're looking at is the same as the number you looked at two trials back. So as you can see on the side, uh, in the first one, you had not seen anything before. You're, you're not supposed to press anything. Five, you can't press anything. Eight, you can't press anything. And then the next five, you have to press because two numbers back, you saw another five, all right? So um, that is a very difficult task because what you have to do is not only remember whether you have seen a five, let's say, or a two, whatever before, but exactly how far before, all right? So this is a very complex uh, working memory task and it includes attention, updating, and inhibition. It's supposed to be very much related to language skills, language learning. Okay, so these were the cognitive tasks that we used. Now we turn to literacy, and we are using ASER tasks because we wanted to use something that has been extensively used in India. So we picked from this task letter naming, single word reading, reading of sentences, but reading passages, a story as well. And what we did, we introduced comprehension questions. We wanted to test children on the comprehension of reading the text. And this task was administered in the school language and English for all children. Those that claimed they did know, not know any English, it was not administered in English, just in the school language. That was the basic literacy test that we used but we also used a higher and a, a more advanced, let's say, literacy test, which includes storytelling and narratives. And uh, you're going to hear more about narratives from the Patna team, Patna plus Hyderabad, I mean, you're everywhere, <laughs> okay. Um, in the, and uh, Lina is going to report uh, on some findings on narratives. I won't report on that uh, in my talk. Now, when it comes to mathematics and uh, numeracy, we use, again, from us, uh, basic numeracy skills. We don't include addition and multiplication because we thought these were easier. Uh, so we use subtraction and division. And division is the hardest of all four. And you will see that children generally, actually, in standard four, have uh, considerable problems with division. But we also wanted to go one step higher in uh, uh, testing numeracy. And what we're looking at is mathematical reasoning tasks. So for that, we use two types of tasks. And this is, I have to admit that if it wasn't for Aminati Panda, uh, I would never have been able to go into this because obviously she's uh, the expert on uh, mathematics and cognition. So um, uh, if you have any crucial questions and difficult ones, you ask her about why we chose this. So um, we use word problems. Now word problems are extremely interesting and I understand that word problems are becoming, you know, um, a, a topic that is interesting for a number of uh, researchers in education. And one of the reasons why word problems are fascinating is because you won't be able to solve a word problem if your mathematical reasoning is not there and if you don't speak the language 
of the problem. If you don't have language ability. So word problems require a very nice interaction between language and maps. So um, we presented them in a written form, but most children could not read the text well. They couldn't understand the problem, so they, we asked the research associates to actually present them orally. And that was fine because we were interested in whether the children could, could solve the problem rather than whether you know, they could read. We had different tasks for reading. So that's an example of a word problem. I hope that by now you have read it. Do you know what the correct answer is? So we give them multiple choice. 18. Yes? Agreed? Well done. OK, and then we go to metamaths. This is the other aspect of higher mathematical reasoning. And in metamaths, it's a different type of task that you have to do. So you say to the child, here is how another child solves these two addition problems. Do you think that they are solved correctly? And if the child says no, they say, well, why is Nita wrong in her responses? And that's the most difficult part, right? Because children take paper and pencil, they do the addition, they see it's wrong. Um, sometimes they do it without paper and pencil. Uh, but then the question, you know, why is it wrong, is something that even some teachers may be unable to express. All right, you may see it's wrong. Uh, so that is a, an advanced, let's say, meta-mathematics. You have to think about mathematical reasoning. And so this is another task that we use with the children. In terms of how many children uh, we have recruited already, uh, we have completed testing of around 1,000 children, mostly from Delhi and Hyderabad, which uh, for us coming from the UK is a mythical number. Right? When we do our studies, we do them with 30, 40, 50, 100 children. But, you know, 1,000 children is, is amazing. And so in that respect, I'm following the advice of the uh, Indian uh, co-investigators and also the Banjan, who told me, you think of India, multiply what you think by 10, and then you get what you, what you really want in terms of power. Uh, we are still uh, analyzing the data. The data collection in Patna is ongoing for reasons that have to do with, not with the project, but with external uh, problems. Um, and we have some preliminary findings from Delhi and Hyderabad that will be presented today in this talk and the three talks later on uh, from each team. So let me just say, okay, so let me just uh, look at uh, some of the children we have. So we've got a total of 413 children from Delhi. And you can see that they are sort of equally distributed in slum and non-slum areas, uh, boys and girls. The age is um, roughly the same. The mean age is roughly the same. But you can see that the in standard four, in some cases, we have four-year difference. So eight to 12-year-old uh, boys uh, in slum, 8 to 11, 8 to 10, and 8 to 9. And this is something that we take into account, we have to take into account in our analysis. So the variables we needed to consider are the location of the school in terms of whether it was close to a slum or not, socioeconomic variables, whether the children are first generation learners, um, the role of English and Hindi in the classroom, and that will be something that Minati will talk about in her talk, so what sort of instruction there was, uh, and whether the home language was Hindi or other, and of course, the gender difference. I'll just give you, in writing, some very preliminary results. So in our results from Delhi, there is no difference in general intelligence among children, and I'm talking about boys and girls, slum and non-slum schools, okay? There's no difference in the ravens. You remember the puzzle. Um, it's also generally found in the Delhi data that girls perform better than boys in English and Hindi literacy. Whereas boys perform better than girls in basic numeracy and in word problems. 
Now, what is really important in the daily data, which, however, will be sort of questioned from the Hyderabad data, and I find this a fascinating contrast, is that children from very deprived areas in Delhi do not seem to lag behind other children, and in some cases, they perform better. So, um, this is something that we need to keep uh, in mind uh, when we are trying to make any generalizations. So let me just show you some results from subtraction and division. I, as I already said, division is very low uh, in standard four. Um, and uh, it seems to be the case that there is an advantage here. So children from schools in slums are doing better um, than the other children and boys perform better than girls. Now, uh, we have the same picture with math word problems, uh, slum schools better than non-slum and boys better than girls. And as I said, this is going to be contradicted later, I think, from uh, the Hyderabad data. There is no difference in the meta-mathematics task, like the, the question of how Nita, why Nita made a mistake. Now, when we focus on gender, what we see um, as I said, is that for literacy in English, girls outperform boys, and that's a significant result. And the same is true for Hindi literacy. So girls uh, outperform boys. So the question we wanted to ask is, what is the role of language and literacy when you are trying to learn mathematics and numeracy, okay? And so the question is, what drives this correlation analysis uh, is literacy related to numeracy and mathematical reasoning skills? And the answer is yes. In fact, there are very strong correlations between ASER literacy scores in Hindi and in English and performance and word problems and metamathematics. The other question we wanted to ask whether general intelligence, the Ravens result, and other cognitive skills, flankers and, uh, and back, are they related to literacy and mathematical abilities, numeracy? The answer is again, yes. So cognitive abilities are very strongly, positively correlated with um, school skills. Okay, so uh, that is something to also keep in mind. Uh, there are many open questions. Uh, in fact, all the questions are open still. <laughs> uh, these are just preliminary uh, data. So, <clears throat> One of the surprising results which we didn't expect to find is that children from the very deprived areas do not seem to underperform compared to the other children. And in fact, having said that, in Hyderabad, this is also true in terms of some tasks. It's not that there is a general uh, contradiction in, in the data. Uh, in fact, in, but in Delhi, in certain school skills, children from slums outperform the others. And the big question is why? <clears throat> Don't we expect that the more deprived <coughs> children would actually uh, show um, lower learning outcomes? And of course, gender differences is a question that we need to look into. So in particular, one of the questions that we haven't addressed, and perhaps we will be unable to address in full in this project, is whether girls in, you know, the disadvantage that we see with girls in um, maths is actually attenuated when you are looking at uh, girls in an all-girls school. Because that is something that has been reported uh, in the literature. We know this is the case. So that will be a question we need. Some of the schools that we are looking at are uh, single-sex schools. Now, in terms of uh, the question about slums, um, and non-slums, and you know, why is it that children in disadvantaged low-income income settlements, which is a very long way of saying slums, uh, is, uh, you know, they seem to be doing fine, actually, overall. Uh, and here is the question, which is a much more general question, that we are not sure yet how to address, but we, we will try in the next two years to tackle that as well. So these children are supposed to have more life experience, better life experience, better not in the sense of quality, but in terms of richness in quantity, right? So um, the, it seems to be the case that for these children, the opportunity to engage with quantity assessments and relating these quantities to money or other quantities is higher 
among children from poor families because the parents often want the children to support them in whatever interactions they have. So there is something about life experience that we need to measure. And if that is measurable and uh, quantifiable in some way, maybe we can use it as a way, an index of better problem solving skills. Um, and of course, the question then is, can we, instead of having to live in a, such a deprived context to get life experience, can we bring life skills into the schools so that we can model some sort of um, equivalent richness in life experience in the school context? So, um, and that has to do a lot with the approach we take to teaching and learning, experiential learning, uh, and uh, the particular subjects uh, that uh, somebody is trying to teach or learn. The factors that we haven't considered yet are factors, and we, we will take into account, are the low school attendance rates that we find more in some areas than others. Um, the question of whether there are schools that actually try to bridge life and school skills, they actually try to bring concrete examples in the teaching of mathematics, for example. We are also looking at linguistic questions that have to do with why the children could not read Hindi, the, the word problems in Hindi or in Telugu. Was it because there is a distance between the written form and the oral language? And I think there is some evidence for that. Um, and also the other question that we want to address is, okay, we will find many of the children that we recruit having a home language different from the language of instruction, but does it matter how linguistically distant the language of instruction is from the home language? So are English, if English and Hindi are second languages for the child, is there a way in which we can decide which is going to be the better choice. And what we are saying is, maybe the one that is closer to the home language is actually a better choice. So the regional language might actually be a better choice. And this is something that we need to look at. Finally, uh, a factor that I never thought of including in the application when we're writing the application, but actually it is a very important factor, especially if you have teaching in a second language rather than your home language is noise, actual noise in the classroom. And we've visited several schools and some of them really have that very serious problem where the teacher could not be heard by the children. The children's responses were not heard by the teacher or the other children. Noise is a very important factor. So I will close here by thanking all the schools, principals, teachers, and children who took part in the project, and they seem to be enthusiastic and very willing to continue. I want to thank the State Council for Education Research and Training in the, the different education ministries in Delhi, Hyderabad, and Patna, and uh, British Council India, of course, for their superb support, and thank you for your attention. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Hello, I'm Tista Bagchi from Delhi University, and I teach linguistics there. Um, my question about this very, very, very ambitious and interesting survey that, uh, you know, uh, uh, that is uh, sort of part of your project is something that relates to a problem relating to differential language policies that are practiced by different states of India. To what extent 
should that be factored in as well? I know that you are interested in the sort of the common outcomes across uh, the surveys and the findings across different states. But given that different states do have different attitudes about what should be the school language, uh, you know, if it's going to be other than English, uh, this, I mean, I see this as a potential factor, at least, that, uh, that might affect the, uh, the, the outcomes of the survey in terms of the differential, small, perhaps small differential results across the different states. But I don't think it can be ignored completely. Um, so, uh, you know, okay. what could be poss a possible way of sort of measuring the differences, if any? Right, well, we certainly have to mention the differences, um, but what the design, and, and, and this is something that might be partly involved in the different results that we get from Delhi and Hyderabad, uh, which uh, will be presented later. Um, so you're right. I mean, we have to take this into account and try and see if that would be a way to explain perhaps apparent contradictions in our data from the two different sites. Um, the uh, design of the project is such that we look for government schools in all states, only government schools, and we look for schools that might have, you know, the regional language in, in, the, in the case of Delhi, we pick Hindi, and I know there are schools that, that have different languages to serve different communities, but we, we focus on Hindi. And uh, for Hyderabad, we, we focused on uh, a Telugu medium. And we compare those with English medium instruction schools. Um, okay, so uh, the design of the study is such that we are trying as much as we can to minimize the differences across um, the, the teaching of the language, you know, in, uh, of a, or rather the use of a language as a medium of instruction in each case. Uh, but yes, we have to look into that. And in fact, now we are forced to look into that because our data do not seem to match. <laughs> so you're absolutely right. We will do that. Um, I'm Anita Rampal from Delhi University. I find this fact that you speak about children's life experience and the fact that slum children are performing better as very interesting and heartening because for the last many, many decades, you know, one has been working especially in mathematics, to try and see that the way the curriculum is designed is completely decontextualized and doesn't make sense. And we have worked on changing textbooks, the national textbooks at the primary level. But I would be curious to know that, you know, when you look at it, uh, those children, you said that you would look at classrooms or what sort of pedagogies teachers are using. But it would be interesting to see how is it that they were going through the school experience for the four years they were there, what kind of books they're using, and uh, is their life experience actually invoked and addressed in their teaching process. But that is not surprising to me. I'm very heartened, in fact. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, so um, I think that... Indeed, I mean, generally the schools, uh, we get some information about the materials that are used in the schools and the teaching practices through the classroom observation tool, but also through the questionnaires that we use for teachers and head teachers. Um, I have to say that um, there is more or less a teacher-based um, and text textbook-based and teacher-centered approach in the schools that we've looked at so far, there is some variation there, but I'm very well aware that there are schools that have uh, pioneered, you know, uh, a much more life, life skills coming into school in the teaching of mathematics in particular. Um, and unfortunately, you know, we, we want our schools to be relatively similar, at least in the base factors like government schools, etc. But uh, we need to look, perhaps, in order to measure this uh, question of life experience, it might be important to actually be directed, perhaps, or guided by uh, people who work in these areas. And we can do some classroom observations 
in these other schools where this method is used uh, and perhaps run just the numeracy tasks with these children trying to see whether there is a difference from the ones we looked at. I mean, this is an excellent suggestion and you know, we will definitely be talking about that. I, I'm really, uh, I was thinking that perhaps one could develop some sort of a, a questionnaire or something to the children, um, asking them to how, how many people they interact with on a daily basis, you know, uh, ages of these people, you know, do they have constant interaction, how many people live in the, in the same house, etc., to get a measure of diversity. Because if you look at numbers, and differences among people, ages, uh, gender, etc., you get a, a, a perspective of the diversity in which the child lives and experiences on a daily basis. And my feeling is that children in uh, these disadvantaged areas would be exposed to much more diversity in the environment than children in, who are deprived but not living in, in, in these areas. But both need to be done. Yes, thank you. Hi, I am uh, Snehal Shah from Right to Education Forum and earlier researcher with Open University. Uh, the finding about uh, slum children, although slum needs to be retired, the word, uh, that they are better at maybe problem solving tasks or something similar that you presented. I'm curious whether the study going forward would be comparing uh, the same thing about rural children and uh, maybe the profiles of all the children uh, looking at their socioeconomic status and running a correlation, uh, the socioeconomic status wise, and would that kind of argument, uh, you know, support the argument for a neighborhood school or a school where uh, children from elite backgrounds and from non-elite backgrounds study together. So we definitely thank you very much for your question. The, the, we, we will, we are looking very much forward to the data from Bihar because that, that's where the rural um, areas will come, you know, the schools will come from. It's not remote rural because we couldn't get to those, but it will be non-remote rural. rural. Um, I, I do not necessarily think that Rural and very disadvantaged in urban areas will be the same. Uh, I don't think there is any principled reason why. Um, obviously, life experience is different, but I think that we, that's why we need to narrow down what we mean by life experience, right? I mean, it's, it will have to be um, uh, a measure that will be able to take into account the rural-urban uh, distinction in the amount of diversity, I think for, for me this is one area where we need to look at, which is how to measure diversity in life uh, in terms of all sorts of factors, in terms of social interaction, um, working, labor, etc. cetera, um, and also the number of different people that you meet um, from different backgrounds and so on. And so I don't know if the rural children will have the same type of diversity that the children in these settlements have because as we said, you know, and as you know, there are a lot of, there's a lot of internal migration moving to this. So you, you, by definition, you're going to have a more diverse environment uh, in these areas. And I don't know whether that's true for the rural areas, but we'll certainly look into that. Thank you. Hello, ma'am. Uh, uh um, you mentioned some of the bilingual, bilingualism benefits in your presentation and uh, one of the benefits was that it uh, inhibition of inappropriate or incorrect responses. So like are there any specific reasons behind it that why or how come does, it, does that happen that bilingualism uh, just offers an opportunity to, to inhibit or, uh, the, um, this incorrect responses? I mean why does that happen? Are there any specific reasons that you can share with us? So, um, well, what has been suggested in the literature is that the reason uh, is if you have more than one language, if you know more than one language, um, every time you use, you use one, you need to suppress the other. So your brain is actually exercising this um, 
in this competition that is going on between the languages. And of course, if we're talking of more than two languages, competition is uh, stronger, right? And the effect should be cumulative. But inhibition in that case would mean stopping the interference, let's say, of one language into the other. And so if it is the case that there is a lot of competition in multilingual brains because of the many languages that they need to control, um, this uh, is like gymnastics to the brain, so it exercises the brain and it's better at doing this inhibition uh, more. So it is actually training that cognitive function which is called inhibition uh, through bilingualism, through uh, the competition between languages. And so that's why they seem to perform better in these tasks. So it is being able to suppress the interference. But you can see how this works in a school environment. So the teacher is talking about something, somebody brings in a different subject, the child needs to put these things together, the teacher brings you back into the original subject, you need to suppress the extra information. That's the type of inhibition we're talking about. All right? Thank you, Professor Simpley, and thank you to the audience for your question.